Part 2, Chapter 7 of The Marriage of William Ashe by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Part 2, Three Years After. Chapter 7. Her ladyship will be in before six, my lady. I was to be sure and ask you to wait if you came before, and to tell you that her ladyship had gone to Madame Fanchette about her dress for the ball. So said Lady Kitty's maid. Lady Tramore hesitated, then said she would wait, and asked that Master Henry might be brought down. The maid went for the child, and Lady Tramore entered the drawing-room. The Ashes had been settled into their marriage in a house in Hill Street, a house to which Kitty had lost her heart at first sight. It was old and distinguished, covered here and there with eighteenth-century decoration, once no doubt a little florid and coarse beside the finer work of the period, but now agreeably blunted and mellowed by time. Kitty had had her impetuous and decided way with the furnishing of it, and, though Lady Tramwell professed to admire it, the result was in truth too French and too pagan for her taste. Her own room reflected the rising worship of Morris and Burne Jones, of which indeed she had been an adept from the beginning. Her walls were covered by the well-known pomegranate or jasmine or sunflower patterns. Her hangings were of mystic greenish blue. Her pictures were drawn either from the Italian primitives or their modern followers. Celtic romance, Christian symbolism, all that was touching, otherworldly and obscure, our late English form, in fact, of the great romantic reaction. It was amid influences of this kind that Lady Tramwell lived and fed her own imagination. The dim, suggestive and pathetic, twilight rather than dawn, autumn rather than spring, yearning rather than fulfilment, the gleam rather than noonday. It was in this half-lit, richly coloured sphere that she and most of her friends saw the tent of beauty pitched. But Kitty would have none of it. She quoted French sceptical remarks about the lakes and joints of the Burne Joan Knights. She declared that so much pattern made her dizzy, and that the French were the only nation in the world who understood a sabre, whether as upholstery or conversation. Accordingly, in days when these things were rare, the girl of eighteen made her new husband provide her with white panel walls, lightly gilt, and with a Persian carpet, of which the mass was of a plain blackish grey, and only the border was allowed to flower. A few Louis Quinze gigandoles on the walls, a vernis martin screen, an old French clock, two or three inlaid cabinets, and a collection of lightly built chairs and settees in the French mode, this was all she would allow. And while Lady Tramwell's room was always crowded, Kitty's, which was much smaller, had always an air of space. French books were scattered here and there, and only one picture was admitted. That was a Watteau sketch of a group from Le Barquement pour saint -Hier. Kitty adored it. Lady Tramwell thought it absurd and disagreeable. As she entered the room now, on this May afternoon, she looked round it with her usual distaste. On several of the chairs, large illustrated books were lying. They contained pictures of 17th and 18th century costume. One of them displayed a coloured engraving of a brilliant Madame de Pompidou, put by Boucher. The maid, who followed her into the room, began to remove the books. Her ladyship has been choosing a costume, my lady, she explained, as she closed some of the volumes. Is it settled? said Lady Tramwell. The maid replied that she believed so, and, bringing a volume which had been laid aside with a mark in it, she opened on a fantastic plate of Madame de Longueville as Diana in a gorgeous hunting dress. Lady Tramwell looked at it in silence. She thought it unseemly, with its bare ankles and sandaled feet, and likely to be extremely expensive. For this Diana of the Fronde sparkled with jewels from top to toe, and Lady Tramwell felt certain that Kitty had already made William promise her the counterpart of the magnificent diamond crescent that shone in the coiffure of the goddess. "'It really seems to be the only one that suited her ladyship,' said the maid, in a deprecating voice. "'I dare say it would look very well,' said Lady Tramwell. "'And four shirt is to make it?' "'If her ladyship is not too late,' said the maid, smiling, but she's taken such a long time to make up her mind. And Fourchette, of course, is driven to death. All the world seems to have gone mad about this ball. 
Lady Trammell shrugged her shoulders in a slight disgust. She was not going. Since her elder son's death, she had had no taste for spectacles of the kind. But she knew very well that fashionable London was talking and thinking of nothing else. She heard that the print room of the British Museum was every day besieged by an eager crowd of fair ladies claiming the services of the museum officials from Dewey Morn till Eve, that historic costumes and famous jewels were to be lavished on the affair, that those who were not invited had not even the resource of contempt, so unquestioned and indutable was the prospect of a really magnificent spectacle, and that the dressmakers of Paris and London, if they survived the effort, would reap a marvellous harvest. And, Mr. Ash, do you know if he is going after all? She answers the maid, as the latter was retreating. Mr. Ash says he will, if he may wear just court dress, said the maid, smiling. Not unless, and her ladyship's afraid he won't be allowed. She'll make him go in costume, thought Lady Tramwell, and he will do it, or anything, to avoid a scene. The maid retired, and Lady Tramwell was left alone. As she sat waiting, a thought occurred to her. She rang for the butler. "'Where is the Times?' she asked when he appeared. The man replied that it was no doubt in Mr. Ash's room, and he would bring it. "'Kitty has probably not looked at it,' thought the visitor. When the paper arrived, she turned at once to the parliamentary report. It contained an important speech by Ash in the house the night before. Lady Tramwell had been disturbed in the reading of it that morning, and had still a few sentences to finish. She read them with pride then glanced again at the leading article on the debate, and at the flattering references it contained to the knowledge, courtesy, and debating power of the Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Ash, said the Times, has well earned the promotion he is now sure to receive before long. In these important rearrangements of some of the higher offices, which cannot be long delayed, Mr. Ash is clearly marked out for a place in the Cabinet. He is young, but he has already done admirable service, and there can be no question that he has a great future before him. Lady Dranmore put down the paper and fell into a reverie. A great future? Yes, if Kitty permitted, if Kitty could be managed. At present it appeared to William's mother that the caprices of his wife were endangering the whole development of his career. There were wheels within wheels, and the newspapers knew very little about them. Three years, was it, since the marriage? She looked back to her dismay when William brought her the news, though it seemed to her that in some sort she had foreseen it from the moment of his first mention of Kitty Bristol, with its eager appeal to her kindness, and that new and indefinable something in voice and manner which put her at once on the alert. Ought she to have opposed it more strongly? She had indeed opposed it, and for a whole wretched week, she, who had never yet gainsaid him in anything, had argued and pleaded with her son, attempting at the same time to bring in his uncles to wrestle with him, seeing that his poor paralysed father was of no account, and so to make a stubborn family fight of it. But she had been simply disarmed and beaten down by William's sweetness, patience, and good humour. Never had he been so determined, and never so lovable. It had been made abundantly plain to her that no wife, however exacting and adorable, should ever rob her, his mother, of one tittle of his old affection. Nay, that, would she only accept Kitty, only take the little forlorn creature into the shelter of her motherly arms, even a more tender and devoted attention than before on the part of her son would be surely hers. He spoke, moreover, the language of sound sense about his proposed bride. That he was in love, Passionately in love was evident. But there were moments when he could discuss Kitty, her family, her bringing up, her gifts and defects, with the same cool acumen, the same detachment, apparently, he might have given, say, to the Egyptian or the Balkan problem. Lady Tramble was not invited to bow before a divinity. She was asked to accept a very gifted and lovely child, often troublesome and provoking, but full of a glorious promise which only persons of discernment, like herself and Ash, could fully realise. He told her, with a laugh, that she could never have behaved even tolerably to a stupid daughter-in-law, whereas let London and society and a few years of love and living do their work, 
and Kitty would make one of the leading women of her time, as Lady Tranmore had been before her. You'll help her, you'll train her, you'll put her in the way, he had said, kissing his mother's hand. And you'll see in the end we shall both of us be so conceited to have had the making of her, there'll be no holding us. Well, she had yielded. Of course she had yielded. She had explained the matter, so far as she could, to the dazed wits of her paralysed husband. She had propitiated the family on both sides. She had brought Kitty to stay with her, and had advised her on the negotiations which banished Madame Destre from London and the British Isles, in return for a handsome allowance and the payment of her debts. And finally, she had, with difficulty, allowed the Grossfields to provide the trousseau and arrange the marriage from Grossfell Park. So eager had she grown in her accepted task. And there had been many hours of high reward. Kitty had thrown herself at first upon William's mother with all the effusion possible. She had been docile, caressing, brilliant. Lady Tranmore had become almost as proud of her gifts, her social effect, and her fast advancing beauty as Ash himself. Kitty's whims and humours, her passion for this person and her hatred of that, her love of splendour and indifference to debt, her contempt of opinion and restraint, seemed to her, as to Ash, the mere crude growth of youth. When she looked at Ash, so handsome, agreeable and devoted, at his place and prestige in the world, his high intelligence and his personal attraction, Ash's mother must needs think that Kitty's mere cleverness would soon reveal to her her extraordinary good fortune, and that whereas he was now at her feet, she before long would be at his. Three years! Lady Tranmore looked back upon them with feeling that wavered like smoke before a wind. A year of excitement, a year of illness, a year of extravagance, shaken moreover by many small gusts of temper and caprice. It was so she might have summarised them. First, a most promising debut in London. Kitty welcomed on all hands with enthusiasm as Ash's wife and her own daughter-in-law, fated to the top of her bent, smiled on at court, flattered by the country houses, always exquisitely dressed, smiling and eager, apparently full of ambition for Ash no less than for herself, a happy, notorious, busy little person, with a touch of wildness that bid him but give the edge to her charm and keep the world talking. Then the birth of the boy, and Kitty's passionate, ungovernable recoil from the deformity that showed itself almost immediately after his birth, a form of infantile paralysis involving a slight but incurable lameness. Lady Tranmore could recall weeks of remorseful fondling, alternating with weeks of neglect. Continued illness and depression on Kitty's part, settling after a while into a petulant melancholy for which the baby's defect seemed but an inadequate cause. Ash's tender anxiety, his willingness to throw out Parliament, office, everything that Kitty might travel and recover, and those huge efforts by which she and his best friends in the house had held him back, when Kitty, it seemed, cared little or nothing whether he sacrificed his future or not. Finally, she herself, with the assistance of a new friend of Kitty's, had become Kitty's nurse, had taken her abroad when Ash could not be spared, had watched over her and humoured her, and at last brought her back, so the doctor said, restored. Was it really recovery? At any rate, Lady Tramwell was often inclined to think that, since the return to London, now about a twelve months since, both she and William had had to do with a different Kitty. Young as she still was, the first exquisite softness of the expanding life was gone. Things harder, stranger, more inexplicable than any which those who knew her best had yet perceived, seemed now and then to come to the surface like wreckage in a summer sea. The opening door disturbed these ponderings. The nurse appeared, carrying the little boy. Lady Tramwell took him on her knees and caressed him. He was a piteous, engaging child, generally very docile, but liable at times to storms of temper out of all proportion to the fragility of his small person. His grandmother was inclined to look upon his passions as something external and inflicted, the entering in of the black-water devil to plague a tiny creature, 
that normally was of a divine and clinging sweetness. She would have taught him religion, as his only shield against himself, but neither his mother nor his father was religious, and Harry was likely to grow up a pagan. He leaned now against her breast, and she, whose inmost nature was maternity, delighted in the pressure of the tiny body, crooning songs to him when they were left alone, and pausing now and then to pity and kiss the little shrunken foot that hung beside the other. She was interrupted by a soft entrance and the rustle of a dress. "'Ah, Margaret!' she said, looking round and smiling. The girl who had come in approached her, shook hands, and looked down at the baby. She was fair-haired and wore spectacles, her face was round and childish, her eyes round and blue with certain lines about them, however, which showed that she was no longer in her first youth. "'I came to see if I could do anything today for Kitty. I know she's very busy about the ball.' "'Head over heels, apparently,' said Lady Tremble. "'Everybody has lost their wits. "'I see Kitty has chosen her dress. "'Yes, if Fanchette can make it all right. "'Poor Kitty, she's been in such a state of mind. "'I think I'll go on with these invitations.' "'And, taking off her gloves and hat, "'Margaret French went to the writing-table "'like one intimately acquainted with the room and its affairs, "'took up a pile of cards and envelopes which lay upon it, "'and, bringing them to Lady Tramwell's side, began to work upon them. "'I did about half yesterday,' she exclaimed, "'but I see Kitty hasn't been able to touch them, "'and it is really time they were out. "'For their party next week?' "'Yes, I hope Kitty won't tire herself out. "'It has been a rush lately.' "'Does she ever rest?' "'Never as far as I could see, "'and I am afraid she has been very much worried.' "'About that silly affair with Prince Stephen,' "'said Lady Tramwell. "'Margaret French nodded. She vows that she meant no harm, and did no harm, and that it has been all malice and exaggeration. But no one can see she has been hurt. Well, if you ask me, said Lady Tramwell, in a low voice, I think she deserved to be. Their eyes met, the girls full of a half-smiling, half-soft consideration. Lady Tramwell, on the other hand, had flushed proudly, as though the mere mention of the matter to which she had referred had been galling to her. Kitty, in fact, had just been guilty of an escapade which had set the town talking, and even found its way here and there in the newspapers. The heir to a European monarchy had been recently visiting London. A romantic interest had surrounded him, for a lady, not of a rank sufficiently high to mate with his, had lately drowned herself for love of him, and the young man's melancholy good looks, together with the magnificent apathy of his manner, drew after him a chain of gossip. Kitty failed to meet him in society. Certain invitations that for once she coveted did not arrive, and in a fit of pique she declared that she would make acquaintance with him in her own way. On a certain occasion when the princeling was at the play, his attention was drawn to a small and dazzling creature in a box opposite his own. Presently, however, there was a commotion in this box. The dazzling creature had fainted, and rumour sent round the name of Lady Kitty Ash. The Prince dispatched an equerry to make inquiries, and the inquiries were repeated that evening in Hill Street. Recovery was prompt, and the Prince let it be known that he wished to meet the lady. Invitations from high quarters descended upon Kitty. She bore herself with an engaging carelessness, and the melancholy youth was soon spending far more pains upon her than he had yet been known to spend upon any other English beauties presented to him. Ash and Kitty's friends laughed. The old general in charge of the princeling took alarm. And presently Kitty's audacities, alack, carried away her discretion. She began, moreover, to boast of her ruse. Whispers crept round, and the general's ears were open. In a few days Kitty's triumph went the way of all earthly things. At a court ball to which her vanity had looked forward, unwarned, the prince passed her with glassy eyes, returning the barest bow to her smiling courtesy. She betrayed nothing, but somehow the thing got out, and set in motion a perfect hurricane of talk. It was rumoured that the old Prime Minister, Lord Parham, had himself said a caustic word to Lady Kitty, that royalty was annoyed, and that William Ashe had for once scolded his wife seriously. 
Lady Trammell was well aware that there was, at any rate, no truth in the last report, but she also knew that there was a tone of sharpness in the London chatter that was new with regard to Kitty. It was as though a certain indulgence was wearing out, and what had been amusement was passing into criticism. She and Margaret French discussed the matter a little, sotto voce, while Margaret went on with the invitations, and Lady Tramore made a French toy dance and spin for the babe's amusement. Their tone was one of close and friendly intimacy, an intimacy based clearly upon one common interest, their relation to Kitty. Margaret French was one of those beings in whom, for our salvation, this halting, hurried world of ours is still on the whole rich. She was unmarried, thirty-five, and poor. She lived with her brother, a struggling doctor, and she had come across Kitty in the first months of Kitty's married life on some fashionable soldiers' aid committee, where Margaret had done the work, and Kitty, with the other great ladies, had reaped the fame. Kitty had developed a fancy for her, and presently could not live without her. But Margaret, though it soon became evident that she had taken Kitty, and in due time the child, Ash too for the matter of that, deep into her generous heart, preserved a charming measure in the friendship offered her. She would owe Kitty nothing, either socially or financially. When Kitty's smart friends appeared, she vanished. Nobody in her own world ever heard her mention the name of Lady Kitty Ash, largely as that name was beginning to figure in the gossip of the day. But there were few things concerning the Hill Street menage that Lady Tramwell could not safely and rightly discuss with her, and even Ash himself went to her for counsel. I was afraid that this had made things worse than ever with the Parhams, said Lady Tramwell presently. Margaret shook her head anxiously. I hope Kitty won't throw over their dinner next week. She's talking of it? Yesterday she'd always made up her mind, said Margaret reluctantly. Perhaps you will persuade her. But she has been terribly angry with Lord Parham, and with Lady P. too. And it was to be a reconciliation dinner, after the old nonsense between her and Lady Parham, sighed Lady Tramwell. It was planned for Kitty entirely. And she is to act something, isn't she, with the young de la Riviere from the embassy? I believe the princess is coming, expressed it to meet her. I've been hearing of it on all sides, but she can't throw it over. Margaret shrugged her shoulders. I believe she will. The older lady's face showed a sudden cloud of indignation. William must really put his foot down, she said in a low, decided voice. It is, of course, most important, just now. She said no more, but Margaret French looked up, and they exchanged glances. Let's hope, said Margaret, that Mr Ash will be able to pacify her. Now, there she is. For the front door closed heavily, and instantly the house was aware from top to toe of a flutter of talk and a frou-frou of skirts. Kitty ran up the stairs and into the drawing-room, still talking apparently to the footman behind her, and stopped short at the sight of Lady Tramwell and Margaret. A momentary shadow passed across her face. Then she came forward, all smiles. "'Why, they never told me downstairs,' she said, taking a hand of each caressingly and slipping into a seat between them. "'Have I lost much of you?' "'Well, I must soon be off,' said Lady Tramwell. "'Harry has been entertaining me.' "'Oh, Harry, is he there?' said Kitty in another voice, perceiving the child behind his grandmother's dress as he sat on the floor, where Lady Tramwell had just deposited him. The baby turned towards his beautiful mother, and as he saw her, a little wandering smile began to spread from his uncertain lips to his deep brown eyes, till his whole face shone, held to hers as to a magnet, in a still enchantment. Come, said the kitty, holding out her hands. With difficulty the child pulled himself towards her, moving in sideway fashion along the floor, and dragging the helpless foot after him. Again the shadow crossed Kitty's face. She caught him up, kissed him, and moved to ring the bell. "'Shall I take him upstairs?' said Margaret. "'Why, he seemed to have only just come down,' said Lady Tramwell. "'Must he go?' "'He can come down again afterwards,' said Kitty. "'I want to talk to you. Take him, Margaret.' The babe went without a whimper, 
still following his mother with his eyes. He looks rather frail, said Lady Tramwell. I hope you'll soon be sending him to the country, Kitty. He's very well, said Kitty. Then she took off her hat and looked at the invitations Margaret had been writing. Heavens, I've forgotten all about them. What an angel is Margaret. I really can't remember these things. They, they ought to do themselves by clockwork. And now Fourchette and this ball are enough to drive one wild. She lifted her hands to her face and pressed back the masses of fair hair that were trembling round it with a gesture of weariness. Fourchette can make your dress? She says she will, but I couldn't make her understand anything I wanted. She's off her head. They all are. By the way, did you hear of Madeleine Alcott's telegram to Worth? No. Kitty laughed. A laugh musical but malicious. Mrs Alcott, married in the same months as herself, had been her companion and rival from the beginning. They called each other Kitty and Madeleine, and saw each other frequently. Why, Lady Trammell could never discover, unless on the principle that it is best to keep your enemy under observation. She telegraphed to Worth as soon as her invitation arrived. Envoyé, tout de suite, costume Venus, réponse. The answer came at dinner. She had a dinner party, and she read it aloud. Remerciement, il dion à pas. Isn't it delightful? Very neat, said Lady Tramwell, smiling. When did you invent that? You, I hear, it to be Diana. Kitty made a gesture of despair. Ask Fonchette, it depends on her. There is no one but she in London who can do it. Oh, by the way, what's Mary going to be? I suppose a Madonna of sorts? Not at all, said Lady Tramwell dryly. She's chosen a Sir Joshua costume I found for her. A vacation missed, said Kitty, shaking her head. She ought to have been a vestal virgin at least. Do you know that you look such a duck this afternoon? The speaker put up two small hands and pulled and patted at the black lace strings of Lady Tramwell's hat which were tied under the delicately wrinkled white of her very distinguished chin. This hat suits you so. You are such a grand dame to it. Ah, je t'adore. And Kitty softly took the chin aforesaid into her hands and dropped a kiss on Lady Tramwell's cheek, which reddened a little under the sudden caress. Don't be a goose, Kitty. But Elizabeth Tramwell stooped forward all the same and returned the kiss heartily. Now tell me what you're going to wear at the Parham's. Kitty rose deliberately, went to the bell and rang it. It must be quite time for tea. You haven't answered my question, Kitty. Haven't I? The butler entered. Tea, please, Wilson, at once. Kitty? Lady Kitty seated herself defiantly a short distance from her mother-in-law and crossed her hands on her lap. I'm not going to the Parham's. Kitty, what do you mean? I am not going to the Parhams, repeated Kitty slowly. They should behave a little more considerately to me if they want to get me to amuse their guests for them. At this moment Margaret French re-entered the room. Lady Tramwell turned to her with a gesture of distress. Oh, Margaret knows, said Kitty. I told her yesterday. The Parhams, said Margaret. Kitty nodded. Margaret paused with her hand on the back of Lady Tramwell's chair, and there was a short silence. Then Lady Trammell began, in a tone that endeavoured not to be too serious. I don't know how you're going to get out of it, my dear. Lady Parham has asked the Princess, first because she wished to come, secondly as an olive branch to you. She's taken the greatest pains about the dinner, and afterwards there's just been an evening party to hear you, just the right size and just the right people. Cela, Mr. Egal, said Kitty, Parfaitement égal. I'm not going. What possible excuse can you invent? I shall have a cold, the most atrocious cold imaginable. I take to my bed just two hours before it is time to dress. My letter reaches Lady Parham on the stroke of eight. Kitty, you have been doing a thing perfectly unheard of, most rude, most unkind. A stiff, slight figure, like a strained wand, did not waver for a moment before the grave indignation of the older woman. I should for once be paying off a score that has run on too long. You and Lady Parham would agree to make friends and let bygones be bygones. That was before last week. 
before Lord Parham said, What annoyed you? Kitty's eyes flamed. Before Lord Parham humiliated me in public, or, or tried to? Dear Kitty, he was annoyed and said a sharp thing, but he's an old man, and for William's sake, surely you can forgive it. And Lady Parham had nothing to do with it. She has not written to me to apologise, said Kitty, with a most venomous calm. Don't talk about it, Mother. It will hurt you, and I am determined. Lady Parham has patronised or snubbed me ever since I married, when she hasn't been setting my best friends against me. She is false, false, false. Kitty struck her hands together with an emphatic gesture. And Lord Parham said a thing to me last week I shall never forgive. Voila. Now I mean to have done with it. And you choose to forget altogether that Lord Parham is William's political chief? That William's affairs are in a critical state and everything depends on Lord Parham? That it is not seemly, not possible that William's wife should publicly slight Lady Parham and through her the Prime Minister? At this moment of all moments. Lady Trammell breathed fast. William will not expect me to put up with insults, said Kitty, also beginning to show emotion. But can't you see that, just now especially, you ought to think of nothing, nothing, but William's future and William's career? William will never purchase his career at my expense. Kitty, dear, listen, cried Lady Trammell in despair, and she threw herself into arguments and appeals, to which Kitty listened, quite unmoved, for some twenty minutes. Margaret French, feeling herself an uncomfortable third, tried several times to steal away. In vain, Kitty's peremptory hand retained her. She could not escape, much as she wished it, from the wrestle between the two women. On the one side, the mother, noble, already touched with age, full of dignity and of protesting affection. On the other, the wife, still little more than a child in years, vibrating through all her slender frame with passion and insolence, more beautiful than usual by virtue of the very fire which possessed her, a menad at bay. Lady Trammell had just begun to waver in a final despair, when the door opened, and William Ash entered. He looked in astonishment at his mother and wife. Then in a flash he understood, and with an involuntary gesture of fatigue he turned to go. William, cried his mother, hurrying after him, don't go. Kitty and I were disputing, but it is nothing, dear. Don't go, you look so tired. Can you stay for dinner? Well, that was my intention, said Ash, with a smile as he allowed himself to be brought back. But Kitty seems to be in the clouds. For Kitty had not moved an inch to greet him. She sat in a high-backed chair, one foot crossed over the other, one hand supporting her cheek looking straight before her with shining eyes. Lady Trammell laid a hand on her shoulder. We won't talk about it any more now, Kitty, will we? Kitty's pinched lips opened enough to omit the words. Perhaps William had better understand. Goodness, cried Ash, is it the Parhams? Send them, Kitty, if you please, to ten thousand Diabla. He won't go to their dinner? Well, don't go. Please yourself and hang the expense. Come and give me some dinner, there's a dear. He bent over and kissed her hair. Lady Trammell began to speak, then with a mighty effort restrained herself and began to look for her parasol. Kitty did not move. Lady Trammell said a muffled goodbye and went. And this time Margaret French insisted on going with her. When Ash returned to the drawing-room, he found his wife still in the same position, very pale and very wild. I've told your mother, William, what I intend to do about the Parhams. Very well, dear, now she knows. She says it will ruin your career. Did she? I'll talk about that presently. We've had a nasty scene in the house with the Irishman. I'm famished. Go and change, there's a dear. Dinner's just coming in. Kitty went reluctantly. She came down in a white flowing garment with a small green wreath in her hair, which, together with the air of a storm which still enwrapped her, made her more mean it like than ever. Ash took no notice, gave her a laughing account of what had passed in the house, and ate his dinner. 
Afterwards, when they were alone and he was just about to return to the house, she made a swift rush across the dining room and caught his coat with both hands. William, I can't go to that dinner. It would kill me. How you repeat yourself, darling, he said with a smile. I suppose you'll give Lady Parham decent notice. What'll you do? Get a doctor's certificate and go away? Kitty panted. Not at all. I shall not tell her till an hour before. Ash whistled. War, I see. Hope of war. Very well, then. Then we shall get to Venice for Easter. Kitty fell back. What do you mean? Very plain, isn't it? But what does it matter? Venice will be delightful, and there are plenty of good men to take my place. Lord Parham will pass you over? Not at all, but I can't work in public with a man who I must cut in private. It wouldn't amuse me. So if you're decided, pit Kitty, and write to Danielle's for rooms. He lit his cigarette and went out with a perfect nonchalance and good temper. Kitty was to have gone to a ball. She countermanded her maid preparations and sent the maid to bed. In due time all the servants went to bed, the front door being left on the latch as usual for Ash's late return. About midnight a little figure slipped into the child's nursery. The nurse was fast asleep. Kitty sat beside the child, motionless, for an hour, and when Ash let himself into the house about two o'clock, he heard a little rustle in the hall, and there stood Kitty, waiting for him. "'Kitty, what are you about?' he said in pretended amazement. But in reality he was not astonished at all. His life, for months past, had been pitched in a key of extravagance and tumult. He had been practically certain that he should find Kitty in the hall. With great tenderness, he half led, half carried her upstairs. She clung to him as passionately as, before dinner, she had repulsed him. When they reached their room, the tired man, dropping with sleep, after a parliamentary wrestle in which every faculty had been taxed to the utmost, took his wife in his arms, and there Kitty sobbed and talked herself into a piece of complete exhaustion. In this state she was one of the most exquisite of human beings, with words, tone and gestures of a heavenly softness and languor. The evil spirit went out of her, and she was all ethereal tenderness, sadness and remorse. For more than two years, scenes like this had, in Ash's case, melted into final delight and intoxication, which more than effaced the memory of what had gone before. Now, for several months, he had dreaded the issue of the crisis, no less than the crisis itself. It left him unnerved, as though some morbid Sirocco had passed over him. When Kitty at last had fallen asleep, Ash stood for some time beside his dressing-room window, looking absently into the cloudy night, too tired even to undress. A gusty northwest wind tore down the street and beat against the windows. The unrest without increased the tension of his mind and body. Like Lady Tramwell, he had, as it were, stepped back from his life and was looking at it, the last three years of it in particular, as a whole. What was the net result of those years? Where was he? Whither were he and Kitty going? A strange pang shot through him. The mere asking of the question had been as the lifting of the lamp of Psyche. The scene that night in the House of Commons had been for him in a scene of conflict, in the name, also, of victory. His virile powers, capacities and ambitions had been at their height. He felt the full spell of the English political life, with all its hard fighting joy, the exhilaration which flows from the vastness of the interests on which it turns, and the intricate appeal it makes, in the case of a man like himself, to a hundred inherited aptitudes, tastes and traditions. And here he stood in the darkness, wondering whether indeed the best of his life were not over. A prey of forebodings as strong and vagrant as the gusts outside. Birds of the night, he forced himself to bed and slept heavily. When he woke up, the May sun was shining into his room. Kitty, in the freshest of morning dresses, was sitting on his bed like a perching bird, waiting impatiently till his eyes should open 
and she could ask him his opinion on her dress for the ball. The savour and joy of life returned upon him in a flood. Kitty was the prettiest thing ever seen. He had scored off those glory fellows the night before. The Parham's dinner was all right, and life was once more kind, manageable, and full of the most agreeable possibilities. A certain indolent patience in him recoiled from the mere recollection of the night before. The worry was over. Why think of it again? End of Part 2, Chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 2, Chapter 8. Meanwhile, Lady Tramwell had reached home, and after one of those pathetic hours in her husband's room which made the secret and sacred foundation of her daily life, she expected Mary Lister, who was to dine at Tramwell House before the two ladies presented themselves at a musical party given by the French ambassadress. Before her guest's arrival, Lady Tramwell wandered about her rooms, unable to rest, unable even to read the evening papers on Ash's speech. So possessed was she still by her altercation with Kitty, and by the foreboding sense of what it meant. William's future was threatened, and the mother, whose whole proud heart had been thrown for years into every successful effort and every upward step of her son, was up in arms. Mary Lister arrived to the minute. She came in, a tall, gliding woman, her hair falling in rippled waves on either side of her face, which in its ample comeliness and placidity reminded the Italianate Lady Tranmore of many faces well known to her in early Sienese or Florentine art. Mary's dress tonight was of a noble red, and the glossy brown of her hair made a harmony both with her dress and with the whiteness of her neck, that contented the fastidious eye of her companion. Polly was now thirty, in the prime of her good looks. Lady Tranmore's affection for her, which had at one time even included the notion that she might possibly become William Ash's wife, did not at all interfere with a shrewd understanding of her limitations. But she was daughterless herself, her family feeling was strong, and Mary's society was an old and pleasant habit one could ill have parted with. In her company, moreover, Mary was at her best. Elizabeth Tranmore never discussed her daughter-in-law with her cousin. Loyalty to William forbade it, no less than a strong sense of family dignity. For Mary had spoken once, immediately after the engagement, with energy, nay with passion, prophesying woe and calamity. Thenceforward it was tacitly agreed between them that all root and branch criticism of Kitty and her ways was taboo. Mary was indeed on apparently good terms with her cousin's wife. She dined occasionally at the Ashes, and she and Kitty met frequently under the wing of Lady Tranmore. There was no cordiality between them, and Kitty was often sharply or sulkily certain that Mary was to be counted among those hostile forces with which, in some of her moods, the world seemed to her to bristle. But if Mary kept in truth a very sharp tongue for many of her intimates on the subject of Kitty, Lady Tranmore, at least, was determined to know nothing about it. On this particular evening, however, Lady Tranmore's self-control failed her for the first time in three years. She had not talked five minutes with her guests before she perceived that Mary's mind was in truth brimful of gossip, the gossip of many drawing-rooms, as to Kitty's escapade with the Prince, Kitty's relations to Lady Parvin, Kitty's parties and Kitty's whims. The temptation was too great. Her own guard broke down. "'I hear Kitty is furious with the Parhams,' said Mary, as the two ladies sat together after their rapid dinner. It was a rainy night, and the fire to which they had drawn up was welcome. Lady Tramwell shook her head sadly. "'I don't know where it is to end,' she said slowly. "'Lady Parham told me yesterday. You don't mind my repeating it?' Mary looked up with a smile. She was still dreadfully afraid that Kitty would play her some trick about next Friday. She knows that Kitty detests her. Oh, no, said Lady Tramwell in a vague voice. Kitty couldn't. Impossible. 
Mary turned an observant eye upon her companion's conscious and troubled air, and drew conclusions not far from the truth. "'And it's all so awkward, isn't it?' she said with sympathy, "'when apparently Lady Parham is as much Prime Minister as he is.' For in those days, certain great houses and political ladies, though not at the zenith of their power, were still, in their comparative decline, very much to be reckoned with. When Lady Parham talked longer than usual with the French ambassador, his Austrian and German colleagues wrote anxious dispatches to their governments. When a special mission to the east of great importance had to be arranged, nobody imagined that Lord Parham had very much to do with the appointment of the commissioner, who happened to have just engaged himself to Lady Parham's second girl. No young member on the government side, if he wanted office, neglected Lady Parham's invitations, and admission to her more intimate dinners was still almost as much coveted as similar favours had been a generation before in the case of Lady Jersey, or still earlier, in that of Lady Holland. She was a small old woman, with a shrewish face, a waxen complexion, and a brown wig. In spite of short sight, she saw things that escaped most other people. Her tongue was rarely at a loss. She was, on the whole, a good friend, though never an unreflecting one, and what she forgave might be safely reckoned as not worth resenting. Elizabeth Tramore received Mary's remark with reluctant consent. Lady Parham, from the English aristocratic standpoint, was not well born. She had been the daughter of a fashionable music master, whose blood was certainly not Christian. And there were many people beside Lady Tramore who resented her domination. It will be so perfectly easy when the moment comes to invent some excuse or other for shelving William's claims, sighed Ash's mother. Nobody is indispensable, but if that old woman is provoked, she will be capable of any mischief. What do you want for William? said Mary, smiling. He ought, of course, to have the Home Office, replied Lady Tranmore, with fire. Mary vowed that he would certainly have it. Kitty is so clever, she will understand how important discretion is before things go too far. Lady Trammell made no answer. She gazed into the fire, and Miss Lister thought her depressed. Has William ever interfered? she asked cautiously. Lady Trammell hesitated. Not that I know of, she said at last, nor will he ever, in the sense in which any ordinary husband would interfere. I know, it is as though he has a kind of superstition about it. Isn't there a fairy story? in which an elf marries a mortal, on condition that if he ever ill-treats her, her people will fetch her back to fairyland. One day the husband who lost his temper and spoke crossly. Instantly there was a crash of thunder, and the elf-wife vanished. I don't remember the story, but it's like that, exactly. He said to me once that he would never have asked her to marry him if he had not been able to make up his mind to let her have her own way, never to coerce her. But having said this, Lady Tramwell repented. It seemed to her she had been betraying William's affairs. She drew her chair back from the fire and rang to ask if the carriage had arrived. Mary took the hint. She arrayed herself in her cloak and chatted agreeably about other things till the moment for their departure came. As they drove through the streets, Lady Tramwell stole a glance at her companion. She's really very handsome, she thought, much better looking than she was at twenty. What are the men about not to marry her? It was indeed a puzzle, for Mary was increasingly agreeable as the years went on, and had now quite a position of her own in London, as a charming woman without angles or apparent egotisms, one of the initiated besides whom any dinner party might be glad to capture. Her relations, near and distant, held so many of the points of vantage in English public life that her word inevitably carried weight. She talked politics, as women of her class must talk them to hold their own. She supported the church, and she was elegantly charitable, in that popular sense which means that you describe to your friends charities without setting up anything of your own. She was rich also, already in possession of a considerable fortune inherited from her mother, and prospective heiress of at least as much again from her father, old Sir Richard Lister, whose house in Somersetshire she managed to perfection. In the season she stayed with various friends, or with Lady Tramwell, Sir Richard being now infirm and preferring the country. 
there was a younger sister who was known to have married imprudently and against her father's wishes some five or six years before this catherine was poor the wife of a clergyman with young children lady trammell sometimes wondered whether mary was quite as good to her as she might be she herself sent catherine various presents in the course of the year for the children yes it was certainly surprising that mary had not married lady trammell's thoughts were running on this tack when of a sudden her eyes were caught by the placard of one of the evening papers. Interview with Mr. Cliff. Peace assured. So ran one of the lines. Geoffrey Cliff, home again. Lady Tramwell's tone betrayed a shade of contemptuous amusement. We shall have to get on without our daily telegram. Poor London. If at that moment it occurred to her to look at her companion, she would have seen a quick reddening of Mary's cheeks. He's had a great success, though, with his telegrams, replied Miss Lister. I should have thought that one couldn't deny him that. Success? Only with the people who don't matter, said Lady Trammell with a shrug. Of what importance is it to anybody that a Geoffrey Cliff should telegraph his doings and his opinions every morning to the English public? We were in the midst of a disagreement with America. A whirlwind was unloosed, and as it happened, Geoffrey Cliff was riding it. For that gentleman had not succeeded in the designs which were occupying his mind when he had first made Kitty's acquaintance in the Grossfield's country house. He had desired an appointment in Egypt, but it had not been given him, and, after some angry restlessness at home, he had once more taken up a pilgrim staff and departed on fresh travels, bound this time for the Pamirs and Tibet. After nearly three years, during which he had never ceased through the newspapers and periodicals, to keep his opinions and his personality before the public, he had been heard of in China, and as returning home by America. He arrived at San Francisco just as the dispute had broken out, was at once captured by an English paper, and sent to New York with carte blanche. He had risen with alacrity to the situation. Thenceforward, for some three weeks, England found a marvellous series of large print telegrams signed Geoffrey Cliff awaiting her every morning on her breakfast table. The President and I met this morning. The President considers and I agree with him. I told the President, etc. The President this morning signed and sealed a memorable dispatch. He said to me afterwards, etc. Two diverse effects seem to have been produced by these proceedings. A certain section of radical opinion which liked to see affairs manage sans ceremony and does not understand what the world wants with diplomatists when journalists are to be had, applauded. The old-fashioned laughed. It was said that Cliff was going into the house immediately. The young bloods of the party in power enjoyed the prospect, and had already stored up the ego et rex meus details of his correspondence for future use. How could a man make such a fool of himself? continued Lady Tramwell, the malice in her voice expressing not only the old aristocratic dislike of the press, but also the jealousy natural to the mother of an official son. "'Well, we shall see,' said Mary, after a pause. "'I don't quite agree with you, Cousin Elizabeth. Indeed, I know there are many people who think that he has certainly done good.' Lady Trammell turned in astonishment. She had expected Mary's assent to her original remark as a matter of course. Mary's old flirtation with Geoffrey Cliff and the long breach between them which had followed it, were things well known to her. They had coincided, moreover, with her own dropping of the man, whom, for various reasons, she had come to regard as unscrupulous and unsafe. Good, she echoed. Good? With that boasting and that fanfaronade? Polly! But Miss Lister held her ground. We must allow everybody their own ways of doing things, mustn't we? I am quite sure he has meant well all through. Lady Tramwell shrugged her shoulders. Lord Parham told me he had had the most grotesque letters from him, and meant head forward to put them in the fire. Very foolish of Lord Parham, said Mary promptly. I should have thought that a Prime Minister would welcome information from all sides. And of course Mr. Cliff thinks that the government has been very badly served. Lady Tramwell's wonder broke out. You don't mean that you hear from him? She turned and looked fully at her companion. 
Mary's colour was still raised, but otherwise she betrayed no embarrassment. Yes, dear cousin Elizabeth, I have heard from him regularly for the past six months. I have often wished to tell you, but I was afraid you might misunderstand me, and my, my courage failed me. The speaker, smiling, laid her hand on Lady Tranmore's. The fact is, he wrote to me last autumn from Japan. You remember that poor cousin of mine who died at Tokyo? Mr. Clifford seen something of him, and he very kindly wrote both to his mother and me afterwards. Then... You didn't forgive him, cried Lady Tramwell. Mary laughed. Was there anything to forgive? We were both young and foolish. Anyway, he interests me, and his letters are splendid. Did you ever tell William you were corresponding with him? No, indeed. But I want very much to make them understand each other better. Why shouldn't the government make use of him? He doesn't wish at all to be thrown into the arms of the other side, but they treat him so badly. My dear Mary, are we governed by the proper people, or are we not? It is no good ignoring the press, said Mary, holding herself gracefully erect, and the bishop quite agrees with me. Lady Tramwell sank back in her seat. You disgusted with the bishop? It was now some time since Mary had last brought the family bishop her cousin and Lady Tranmore's, to bear upon an argument between them. But Elizabeth knew that his appearance in the conversation invariably meant a fait accompli of some sort. "'I read him some of Mr. Tiff's letters,' said Mary modestly. "'He thought them most remarkable.' "'Even when he mocks at missionaries?' "'Oh, but he doesn't mock at them any more. He has learned wisdom. I assure you he has.' Lady Tranmore's patience almost departed. Mary's look was so penetrated with indulgence for the prejudices of a dear but unreasonable relation. But she managed to preserve it. And you knew he was coming home? Oh, yes, said Mary. I meant to have told you at dinner, but something put it out of my head. Kitty, of course. I shouldn't wonder if he were at the embassy tonight. Polly, tell me. Lady Trammell gripped Miss Lister's hand with some force. Are you going to marry him? Not that I know of, was the smiling reply. Don't you think I'm old enough by now to have a man-friend? And you expect me to be civil to him? Well, dear cousin Elizabeth, you know you never did break with him quite. Lady Trammell, in her bewilderment, reflected that she had certainly meant to complete the process whenever she and Mr. Cliff should meet again. Aloud, she could only say, rather stiffly, I can't forget that William disapproves of him strongly. Oh, no, excuse me, I don't think he does, said Mary quickly. He said to me the other day that he should be very glad to pick his brains when he came home. And then he laughed and said he was a deuced clever fellow. Excuse the adjective. And it was a great thing to be as free as that chap was, without all sorts of boring colleagues and responsibilities. Wasn't it like William? Lady Trammell sighed. William shouldn't say those things. Of course, dear, he was only in fun. But I'll lay you a small wager, Cousin Elizabeth, that Kitty will ask Mr. Tiff to lunch as soon as she knows he's in town. Lady Tramwell turned away. I dare say, no one can answer for what Kitty will do. But Geoffrey Cliff has said scandalous things of William. He won't say them again, said Mary soothingly. Besides, William never minds being abused a bit, does he? He should mind, said Lady Tramwell, drawing herself up. In my young days, our enemies were our enemies, and our friends our friends. Nowadays, nothing seems to matter. You may call a man a scoundrel one day and ask him to dinner the next. We seem to use words in a new sense, and I confess I don't like the change. Well, Mary, I shan't, of course, be rude to any friend of yours, but don't expect me to be effusive. And please remember that my acquaintance with Geoffrey Cliff is older than yours. Mary made a caressing reply, and gave her mind for the rest of the drive to the smoothing of Lady Tranmore's ruffled plumes. But it was not easy. As that lady made her way up the crowded staircase of the French Embassy, her fine face was still absent and a little stern. Mary could only reflect that she had at least got through a first explanation which was bound to be made. Then for a few minutes her mind surrendered itself wholly to the question, Will he be here?
The rooms of the French embassy were already crowded. An ambassador, short, stout, and somewhat morose, his plain features and snub nose emerging with difficulty from his thick, fair hair, superabundant beard and moustache, with an elegant and smiling ambassadress, personifying amid the English crowd that Paris from which through every fibre she felt herself a pining exile, received the guests. The scene was ablaze with uniforms, for the speaker had been giving a dinner, and royalty was expected. But, as Lady Trammell perceived at once, very few members of the House of Commons were present. A hot debate on some detail of the naval estimates had been sprung on ministers, and the whips on each side had been peremptorily keeping their forces in hand. "'I don't see either William or Kitty,' said Mary, after a careful scrutiny, not in truth directed to the discovery of the ashes. "'No, I suppose William was kept, and Kitty did not care to come alone.' Mary said nothing, but she was well aware that Kitty was never restrained from going into society by the mere absence of her husband. Meanwhile, Lady Tramore was lost in secret anxieties as to what might have happened in Hill Street. Had there been a quarrel? Something certainly had gone wrong, or Kitty would be here. Lady Kitty not arrived, said a voice, like a macaw's, beside her. Elizabeth turned and shook hands with Lady Parham. That extraordinary woman, followed everywhere by the attentive observation of the crowd, had never asserted herself more sharply in dress, manner and coiffure than on this particular evening, so it seemed at least to Lady Tramore. Her ample figure was robed in the white sativer of a bride, her wrinkled neck disappeared under a weight of jewels, and her bright chestnut wig, to which the diamond tiara was fastened, positively attacked the spectator, so patent was it, and unashamed. Unashamed, too, were the bold, tyrannous eyes, the rouge spots on either cheek, the strength of the jaw, the close-shut ability of the mouth. Elizabeth Tramore looked at her with a secret passion of dislike. Her English pride of race, no less than the prejudices of her taste and training, could hardly endure the fact that, for William's sake, she must make herself agreeable to Lady Parham. Agreeable, however, she tried to be. Kitty had seen tired in the afternoon and had no doubt gone to bed, so she averred. Lady Parham laughed. Well, she mustn't be tired the night of my party next week, or the skies will fall. I never took so much trouble before about anything in my life. No, she must take care, said Lady Tramore. Unfortunately, she is not strong, and she does too much. Lady Parham threw her a sharp look. Not strong? I should have thought Lady Kitty was made on wires. Well, if she fails me, I shall go to bed, with smallpox. There will be nothing else to be done. The Princess has actually put off another engagement to come. She's heard so much of Lady Kitty's reciting. But you'll help me through, won't you? And the wrinkled face and harsh lips fell into a contortion meant for a confidential smile, while through it all the eyes, wholly independent, studied the face beside her closely suspiciously, until the owner of it, in her discomfort, could almost have repeated aloud the words that were ringing in her mind. "'I shall not go to Lady Parham's. My note will reach her on the stroke of eight. "'Certainly I will keep an eye on her,' she said lightly. "'But you know, since her illness—' "'Oh, no,' said Lady Parham impatiently. "'She is very well, very well indeed. I never saw her look so radiant. "'By the way, did you hear your son's speech the other night? I did not see you in the gallery.' Great pity if you missed it. It was admirable. Lady Trammell replied regretfully that she had not been there, and she had not been able to have a word with him about it since. Oh, he knows he did well, said Lady Parham carelessly. They all do. Lord Parham was delighted. He could do nothing but talk about it at dinner. He says they were in a very tight place, and Mr. Ash got them out. Lady Trammell expressed her gratification with all the dignity she could command. Conscious, meanwhile, that her companion was not listening to a word, absorbed as she was in a hawk-like examination of the room through a pair of gold-rimmed eyeglasses. Suddenly the eyeglasses fell with a rattle. "'Good heavens!' cried Lady Parham. "'Do you see who that is talking to Mr. Lorraine?' Lady Tramore looked, and at once perceived Geoffrey Cliff in close conversation with the leader of the opposition. The lady beside her gave an angry laugh. If Mr. Cliff thinks he has done himself any good by these ridiculous telegrams of his, he will find himself mistaken. 
People are perfectly furious about them. Naturally, said Lady Tramwell, only that it is a pity to take him seriously. Oh, I don't know. He has his following. Unfortunately, some of our own men are inclined to think that Parham should conciliate him. Ignore him, I say. Behave as though he didn't exist. Ah, by the way, the speaker raised herself on tiptoe and said in an audacious undertone, is it true that he may possibly marry your cousin, Miss Lister? Lady Tramwell kept her smiling composure. Is it true that Lord Parham may possibly give him an appointment? Lady Parham turned away in annoyance. Is that one of the inventions going about? There are so many, said Lady Tramwell. At that moment, however, to her infinite relief, her companion abruptly deserted her. She was free to observe the two distant figures in conversation, Geoffrey Cliff and Mr Lorraine, the latter a man now verging on old age, white-haired and wrinkled, but breathing still through every feature and every movement the scarcely diminished energy of his magnificent prime. He stood with bent head, listening attentively, but, as Lady Tramwell thought, coldly, to the arguments that Cliff was pouring out upon him. Once he looked up in a sudden recoil, and there was a flash from an eye famous for its power of majestic or passionate rebuke. Cliff, however, took no notice, and talked on, the rain still listening. "'Look at them!' said Lady Parham, venomously, in the ear of one of her intimates. "'We shall have all this out in the house tomorrow.' The opposition mean to play that man for all he's worth. Mr. Lorraine, too, with his puritanical ways. I know what he thinks of Cliff. He wouldn't touch him in private. But in public, you'll see, he'll swallow him whole, just to annoy Parham. There's your politician. And stiff with the angry virtue of the inns denouncing the faction of the outs, Lady Parham passed on. Elizabeth Tramwell, meanwhile, turned to look for Mary Lister. She found her close behind, engaged in a perfunctory conversation which evidently left her quite free to follow things more exciting. She, too, was watching, and presently it seemed to Lady Tramwell that her eyes met with those of Cliff. Cliff paused, abruptly lost the thread of his conversation with Mr Lorraine, and began to make his way through the crowded room. Lady Tramwell watched his progress with some attention. It was the progress, clearly, of a man much in the eye and mouth of the public. Whether the atmosphere surrounding him in these rooms was more hostile or more favourable, Lady Tramwell could not be quite sure. Certainly the women smiled upon him, and his strange face, thinner, browner, more weather-beaten and life-beaten than ever, under its crest of grizzling hair, had the old, arrogant, and picturesque power. But, as it seemed to her, with something added, something subtler was it, more romantic than of yore, which arrested the spectator. Had he really been in love with that French woman? Lady Tramwell had heard it rumoured that she was dead. It was not towards Mary Lister primary that he was moving, Elizabeth soon discovered. It was towards herself. She braced herself for the encounter. The greeting was soon over. After she herself had said the appropriate things, Lady Tramor had time to notice that Mary Lister, whose turn came next, did not attempt to say them. She looked indeed unusually handsome and animated. Lady Tramor was certain that Cliff had noticed as much at his first sight of her. But the remarks she admitted showed how minute and recent was their knowledge of each other's movements. Cliff himself gave a first impression of high spirits, he declared that London was more agreeable than he had ever known it, and that, after his three years' absence, nobody looked a day older. Then he inquired after Ash. Lady Trammell replied that William was well, but hard-worked. She hoped to persuade him to get a few days abroad at Whitsuntide. Her manner was quiet, without a trace of either discourtesy or effusion. Cliff began to twist his moustache, a sign she knew well. It meant that he was in truth both irritable and nervous. You think they'll last till Whitsuntide? The government, she said, smiling. Certainly, and beyond. I give them three weeks, said Cliff, twisting anew, with a vigour that gave her a positive physical sympathy with the tortured moustache. There will be some papers out tomorrow that will be a bombshell. About America? Oh, they have been blown up so often. You, for instance, have been doing your best for months. His perfunctory laugh answered the mockery of her charming eyes. 
when I wish I could make William hear reason. Lady Tramore held herself stiffly. The Christian name seemed to her an offence. It was true that in old days he and Cliff had been on those terms. Now it was a piece of bad taste. Probably what is reason to you is folly to him, she said dryly. No, no, he knows, said Cliff with impatience. The others don't. Parham is more impossible, more crassly, grossly ignorant. He lifted hands and eyes in protest. But Ash, of course, is another matter altogether. Well, go and see him, go and talk to him, said Lady Tramore, still mocking. There are no lions in the way. None, said Cliff. As a matter of fact, Lady Kitty has asked me to luncheon. But does one find Ash himself in the middle of the day? At the mention of her daughter-in-law, Elizabeth made an involuntary movement. Mary, standing beside her, turned towards her and smiled. Not often. The tone was cold. But you could always find him at the house. And Lady Tramwell moved away. Is there a quiet corner anywhere? said Cliff to Mary. I have such heaps to tell you. So, while some Polish gentleman in the main drawing-room, whose name ended in Ski, challenged his violin to the impossible, Cliff and Mary retired from observation into a small room thrown open with the rest of the suite, which was, in truth, the morning room of the ambassadress. As soon as they found themselves alone, there was a pause in their conversation, each involuntarily looking at the other. Mary certainly recognised that these years of absence had wrought a noticeable change in the man before her. He had aged. Hard living and hard travelling had left their marks. But, like Lady Tramore, she also perceived another difference. The eyes bent upon her were indeed, as before, the eyes of a man self-centred, self-absorbed. There was no chivalrous softness in them, no consideration. The man who owned them used them entirely for his own purposes. They betrayed none of that changing instinctive relation towards the human being, any human being, within their range, which makes the charm of so many faces. But they were sadder, more sombre, more restless. They thrilled her more than they had already thrilled her once in the first moment of her youth. What was he going to say? From the moment of his first letter to her from Japan, Mary had perfectly understood that he had some fresh purpose in his mind. She was not anxious, however, to precipitate the moment of explanation. She was no longer the young girl whose equilibrium is upset by the mere approach of the man who interests her. Moreover, there was a past between herself and Cliff, the memory of which might indeed point her to caution. Did he now, after all, want to marry her? Because she was rich and he was comparatively poor, and could only secure an English career at the cost of a well-stored wife? Well, all that should be thought over, by herself no less than by him. Meanwhile, her vanity glowed within her, as she thus held him there, alone, to the discomfiture of other women more beautiful and more highly placed than herself. As she remembered his letters in her desk at home, and the secret she imagined him to have told her. Then again she felt a rush of sudden disquiet caused by this new aspect, wavering and remote, as though some hidden grief emerged and vanished. He had the haggard air of a man who scarcely sleeps. All that she had ever heard of the French affair rushed through her mind, stirring there an angry curiosity. These impressions, however, took but a few minutes, while they exchanged some conventionalities. Then Cliff said, scrutinising the face and form beside him with an intentness, which, from him, was more generally taken as compliment than offence. Will you excuse the remark? There are no women who keep their first freshness like English women. Thank you. If we feel fresh, I suppose we look it. As for you, you clearly want a rest. No time to think of it, then. I've come home to fight. All I know, to make myself as odious as possible. Mary laughed. You've been doing that so long. Why not try the opposite? Cliff looked at her sharply. You think I've made a failure of it? Not at all. You've made everybody furiously uncomfortable. And you see how civil even the radical papers are to you. Yes, what fools, said Cliff shortly. Now soon leave that off. Just now I am a stick to beat the government with. But you don't believe I shall carry my point? The point concerned a particular detail in a pending negotiation with the United States. Cliff had been denouncing the government for what he conceived to be their coming retreat before American demands. 
America, according to him, had been playing the bully, and English interests were being betrayed. Mary considered. I think you will have to change your tactics. Dictate them, then. He bent forward with that sudden change of manner, that courteous sweetness of tone and gesture, which few women could resist. Mary's heart, seasoned though it were, felt a charming flutter. She talked, and she talked well. She had no independence of mind and very little real knowledge, but she had an excellent reporter's ability. She knew what to remember and how to tell it. Cliff listened to her attentively, acknowledging to himself the while that she had certainly gained. She was a far more definite personality than she had been when he last knew her, and her self-possession, her trained manner, rested him. Thank heaven she was not a clever woman. How he detested the breed! But she was a useful one. And the smiling commonplace into which she fell so often was positively welcome to him. He had known what it was to court a woman who was more than his equal, both in mind and passion, and it had left him bitter and broken. "'Well, all this is most illuminating,' he said at last. "'I owe you immense thanks.' And he put out a pair of hands, thin, brown, and weather-stained as his face, and pressed one of hers. "'We are very old friends, aren't we?' "'Are we?' said Mary, drawing back. "'Oh, so far as anyone can be the friend of a chap like me,' he said hastily. "'Tell me, are you with Lady Tramore?' "'No, I go to her in a few days, till I leave London.' "'Don't go away,' he said suddenly and insistently. "'Don't go away.' Mary could not help a slight wavering in the eyes that perforce met his. Then he said abruptly as she rose, "'By the way, they tell me Ash is a great man.' She caught the note of incredulous contempt in his voice and laughed. "'They say he'll be in the cabinet directly.' And Lady Kitty, I understand, is a scandal to gods and men, and the most fashionable person in town? No, oh, not now, said Mary. That was last year. You mean people are tired of her? Well, after a time, you know, a, a naughty child. Becomes a bore. Is she a bore? I doubt. I very much doubt. Go and see, said Mary. When do you lunch there? I think tomorrow. Shall I find you? Oh, no, I am not at all intimate with Lady Kitty. Cliff's slight smile, as he followed her into the large drawing-room, died under his moustache. He divined at once the relation between the two, or thought he did. As for Mary, she caught her last sight of Cliff, standing bareheaded on the steps of the embassy, his lean distinction, his ugly good looks marking him out from the men around him. Then, as they drove away, she was glad that the darkness hid her from Lady Tranmore. For suddenly she could not smile. She was filled with the perception that if Geoffrey Cliff did not now ask her to marry him, life would utterly lose its savour, its carefully cherished and augmented savour, and youth would abandon her. At the same time she realised that she would have to make a fight of it, with every weapon she could muster. End of Part 2, Chapter 8《Part 2, Chapter 9 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. — Part 2, Chapter 9 — Wasn't I expected? said Darrell, with a chilly smile. "'Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir,' said the Ashes butler, as he looked distractedly round the drawing-room. "'I believe her ladyship will be in directly. Would you kindly take a seat?' The man's air of resignation convinced Darrell that Lady Kitty had probably gone out without any orders to her servants, and had now forgotten all about her luncheon party, a state of things to which the Hill Street household was, no doubt, well accustomed. "'I shall claim some lunch,' he thought to himself. "'Whatever happens, these young people want keeping in their place. "'Ah!' For he had observed, placed on a small easel, "'the print of Madame de Longueville in costume, "'and he put up his eyeglass to look at it. "'He guessed at once that its appearance there "'was connected with the fancy ball "'which was now filling London with its fame, "'and he examined it with some closeness. 
Lady Kitty will make a stir in it, no doubt of that, he said to himself as he turned away. She has the keenest flair of them all for what produces an effect. None of the others can touch her. Mrs. Alcott, none of them. He was thinking of the other members of a certain group, at that time well known in London society, a group characterised chiefly by the beauty, extravagance and audacity of the women belonging to it. It was by no means a group of mere fashionables. It contained a large amount of ability and accomplishment. Some men of aristocratic family, who were also men of high character with great futures before them. Some persons from the literary or artistic world, who possessed, besides their literary or artistic gifts, a certain art of agreeable living, and some few others, especially young girls, admitted generally for some peculiar quality of beauty or manner outside the ordinary canons. Money was really presupposed by the group as a group. The life they belonged to was a life of the rich. The houses they met in were rich houses. But money, as such, had no power whatever to buy admission to their ranks, and the members of the group were at least as impatient of the claims of mere wealth as they were of those of mere virtue. On the whole, the group was an element of ferment and growth in the society that had produced it. Its impatience of convention and restraint, the exultation of intellectual or artistic power which prevailed in it, and even the angry opposition excited by its pretensions and its exclusiveness, were all, perhaps, rather profitable than harmful at that moment of our social history. Old customs were much shaken, the new were shaping themselves, and this daring coterie of young and brilliant people, living in one another's houses, calling one another by their Christian names, setting a number of social rules at defiance, discussing books, making the fame of artists and now and then influencing politics, were certainly helping to bring the new world to birth. Their foes called them the Archangels, and they themselves had accepted the name with complacency. Kitty, of course, was an archangel. So was Mrs. Alcott. Cliff had belonged to them before his travels began. Louis Harmon was more or less of their tribe, and Lady Tranmore, though not herself an archangel, entertained the set in London and in the country. Like various older women connected with the group, she was not of them, but she harboured them. Darrow was well aware that he did not belong to them, though personally he was acquainted with almost all the members of the group. He was not completely indifferent to his exclusion, and this fact annoyed him more than the exclusion itself. He had scarcely finished his inspection of the print when the door again opened and Geoffrey Cliff entered. Darrell had not yet seen him since his return and since his attack on the government had made him the hero of the hour. Of the newspaper success, Darrell was no less jealous and contemptuous than Lady Tramore, though for quite other reasons. But he knew better than she the intellectual quality of the man, and his disdain for the journalist was tempered by his considerable, though reluctant, respect for the man of letters. They greeted each other coolly, whilst Cliff, not seeing his hostess, looked round him with annoyance. "'Well, we should probably entertain each other,' said Darrell as they sat down. "'Lady Kitty often forgets her engagement.' "'Does she?' said Cliff coldly, pretending to glance through a book beside him. It touched his vanity that his hostess was not present, and still more that Darrell should suppose him a person to be forgotten. Darrell, however, who had no mind for any discomfort that might be avoided, made a few dexterous advances, Cliff's brow relaxed, and they were soon in conversation. The position of the Ministry naturally presented itself as a topic. Two or three retirements were impending. The whole position was precarious. Would the Cabinet be reconstructed without a dissolution, or must there be an appeal to the country? Cliff was passionately in favour of the latter course. The party fortunes could not possibly be retrieved without a general shuffling of the cards, and an opportunity for some wholly fresh combination involving new blood. In any case, said Cliff, I suppose our friend here is sure of one or other of the big posts. William Ash, oh, I suppose so, unless some intrigue gets in the way. Darrell dropped his voice. Parham doesn't, in truth, hit it off with him very well. Ash is too clever, and Parham doesn't understand his paradoxes. Also, I gather, said Cliff with a smile, that Lady Parham has her say. Darrell shrugged his shoulders. It seemed incredible that one should still have to reckon with that kind of thing at this time of day. 
but I dare say it's true. However, I imagine Lady Kitty... By the way, how much longer shall we give her? Slip looked at his watch with a frown. May, may be trusted to take care of that. Darrell merely raised his eyebrows without replying. What, not a match for one Lady Parham? said Cliff with a laugh. I should have thought from my old recollections of her that she would have been a match for twenty. Oh, if she cared to try. She is not ambitious? Certainly, but not always for the same thing. She is trying to run too many horses abreast. <laughs> I am not a great friend, said Darrell, smiling. I should never dream of analysing Lady Kitty. Ah, he turned his head. Are we not forgotten, or just remembered? Which? For a rapid step approached, the door opened, and a lady appeared on the threshold. It was not Kitty, however. The newcomer advanced, putting up a pair of fashionable eyeglasses, and, looking at the two men in a kind of languid perplexity, intended, as Darrell immediately said to himself, merely to prolong the moment and the effect of her entry. Mrs. Orcott was very tall and inordinately thin. Her dark head on its slim throat, the poetic lines of the brow, the half-shut eyes, the gleam of her white teeth, and all the delicate detail of her dress, and, one might even say, of her manner, gave an impression of beauty, though she was not, in truth, beautiful. But she had grace, and she had daring, the two essential qualities of an archangel. She was also a remarkable artist, and no small critic. Mr. Cliff, she said with a start of what was an evidently agreeable surprise, Kitty never told me. When did you come? I arrived a few days ago. Why weren't you at the embassy last night? Because I was much better employed. I have given up crushes, but I would have come to meet you. Ah, Mr. Darrell, she added in another tone, holding out an indifferent hand. Where is Kitty? She looked round her. Shall we order lunch? said Darrell, who had given her a greeting as careless as her own. Kitty is really too bad. She is never less than an hour late, said Mrs. Alcott, seating herself. Last time she dined with us, I asked her for 7.30. She thought something very special must be happening and arrived breathless at half-past eight. Then she was furious with me because she was not the last. But one can't do it twice. Well, addressing herself to Cliff, are you come home to stay? That depends, said Cliff, on whether England makes itself agreeable to me. What are your deserts? Why should England be agreeable to you? She replied with a smiling sharpness. You do nothing but croak about England. Thus challenged, Cliff sat down beside her, and they fell into a bantering conversation. Darrell, though inwardly wounded by the small trouble they took to include him, let nothing appear, put in a word now and then, or turned over the pages of the illustrated books. After five minutes, a fresh guest arrived. In walked the little dean, Dr. Winston, who had originally made acquaintance with Lady Kitty at Graceville Park. He came in overflowing with spirits and enthusiasm. He had been spending the morning in Westminster Abbey with another dean more famous, though not more charming, than himself, and with yet another congenial spirit, one of the younger historians, all of them passionate lovers of the rich human detail of the past, the actual men and women, kings, queens, bishops, executioners, and all the shreds and tatters that remained of them. Together they had opened a royal tomb, and the dean's eyes were sparkling as though the ghost of the queen whose ashes he had been handing still walked and talked with him. He passed, in his light, disinterested way, through most sections of English society, though the slave of none, and he greeted Darrell and Mrs. Alcott as acquaintances. Mrs. Alcock introduced Cliff to him, and the small dean bowed rather stiffly. He was a supporter of the government, and he thought Cliff's campaign against them vulgar and unfair. "'Is there no hope of Lady Kitty?' he said to Mrs. Alcott. "'Not much. Shall we go down to lunch?' "'Without our hostess?' the dean opened his eyes. "'Oh, Kitty expects it,' said Mrs. Orcott, with affected resignation. "'And the servants are quite prepared. "'Kitty asked everybody to lunch. "'Then somebody asks her, and she forgets. "'It's quite simple.' "'Quite,' said Cliff, buttoning up his coat. "'But I think I shall go to the club.' "'He was looking for his hat when again there was a commotion on the stairs, "'a high voice giving orders, and in burst Kitty.' She stood still as soon as she saw her guests, talking so fast and pouring out such a flood of excuses that no one could get in a word. Then she flew to each guest in turn, taking them by both hands, Darrell only excepted, 
and showing herself so penitent, amusing and charming that everybody was propitiated. It was Fourchette, of course. Fourchette, the criminal, the incomparable. Her dress for the ball. Kitty raised her eyes and hands to heaven. It would be a marvel, a miracle, unless indeed she were lying cold and quiet in a little grave before the time came to wear it. But Fanchette's tempers, Fanchette's caprices, no. Kitty began to mimic the great dressmaker, torn to pieces by the crowd of fashionable ladies, stopping abruptly in the middle to say to Cliff, You were going away? I saw you take up your hat. I despaired of my hostess, said Cliff with a smile. Then, as he perceived that Mrs. Alcott had taken up the theme and was holding the others in play, and I was in no mood for second best. Kitty's eyes twinkled a moment as she turned them on Madeleine Alcott. Ah, oh, I remember, a graceful park. What a bad temper you had. You would have gone away furious. With disappointment, yes, said Cliff, as he looked at her with an admiration he scarcely endeavoured to conceal. Kitty was in black, but a large hat of white tulle, in the most extravagant fashion of the day, made a frame for her hair and eyes, and increased the general lightness and fantasy of her appearance. Cliff tried to recall her as he had first seen her at Graceful Park, but his recollection of the young girl could not hold its own against the brilliant and emphatic reality before him. At luncheon it chafed him that he must divide her with the dean. Yet she was charming with the old man, who chatted history, art and Paris to her, with a delightful innocence and ignorance of all that made Lady Kitty Ash the talk of the town, and an old-fashioned deference besides, that insensibly curbed her manner and her phrases as she answered him. Yet when the dean left her free, she returned to Cliff, as though in some sort they two had really been talking all the time, through all the apparent conversation with other people. "'I have read all your telegrams,' she said. "'Why did you attack William so fiercely?' Cliff was taken by surprise, but he felt no embarrassment. Her tone was not that of the wife in arms. I attacked the official, not the man. William knows that. He's coming in today, if possible. He wanted to see you. Good news. William knows that he would have hit just as hard in my place. I don't think he would, said Kitty calmly. He is so generous. The colour rushed to Cliff's face. Well scored. I wish I had a wife to play these strokes for me. I shall argue that a keen politician has no right to be generous. He is at war. Kitty took no notice. She leaned her little chin on her hand, and her eyes perused the face of her companion. Where have you been all the time, before America? In the deserts, fighting devils, said Cliff, after a moment. What does that mean? she asked, wondering. Read my new book. That will tell you about the deserts. And the devils? Ah, I keep them to myself. Do you? she said softly. I have just read your poems over again. Cliff gave a slight start, then looked indifferent. Have you? But they were written three years ago. Dear mercy, one finds new devils like new acquaintances. She shook her head. What do you mean? he asked her, half amused, half arrested. They are always the old, she said in a low voice. Their eyes met. In hers was the same veiled, restless melancholy as in his own. Together with the dazzling air of youth that surrounded her, the cherished, flattered, luxurious existence that she and her house suggested, they made a strange impression upon him. Does she mean to me to understand that she is not happy? He thought to himself. But the next moment she was engaged in a merry chatter with the dean, and all trace of the mood she had thus momentarily showed him had vanished. Halfway through the luncheon, Ash came in. He appeared fresh and smiling, irreproachably dressed, and showing no trace whatever of the hard morning of official work he had just passed through, nor of the many embarrassments which, as everyone knew, were weighing on the Foreign Office. The Dean, with his keen sense for the dramatic, watched the meeting between him and Cliff with some closeness, having in mind the almost personal duel between the two men a duel of letters, telegrams or speeches which had been lately carried on in the sight of Europe and America. For Ash now represented the Foreign Office in the House of Commons and had been much badgered by the Tory extremists who followed Cliff. Naturally, being Englishmen, they met as though nothing had happened and they had parted the day before in Pall Mall. Uh, hello, Ash, and hello, Cliff. Glad to see you again. 
completed the matter. The dean enjoyed it as a specimen of English phlegm, recalling with amusement his last visit to the Paris of the Second Empire. Paris, torn between government and opposition, the salon of the one divided from the salon of the other by a sulphurous gulf, unless when some Lazarus of the moment, some well-known novelist or poet, cradled in the Abraham's bosom of liberalism, passed amid shrieks of triumphs or howls of treason into the official inferno. Not that there was any avoiding of topics in this English case. Ash had no sooner slipped into his seat than he began to banter Cliff upon a letter of a supporter which had appeared in that morning's Times. It was written by Lord S., who had played the part of public fool for half a generation. To be praised by him was disaster, and Cliff's flush showed at once that the letter caused him acute annoyance. He and Ash fell upon the writer, vying with each other in anecdotes that left him presently close-plucked and bare. "'That's all very well,' said Kitty, amid the laughter which greeted the last tale. "'But he never told you how he proposed to the second Lady S.' And, lifting a red strawberry which she held poised against her red, laughing lips, she waited a moment, looking round her. "'Go on, Kitty,' said Ash approvingly. "'Go on!' Thus permitted, Kitty gave one of the little scenes, arranged for some experience of her own, which were very famous among her intimates. Ash called them her parlour tricks, and was never tired of making her exhibit them. And now, just as at Grosville Park, she held her audience. She spoke without a halt, her small features answering perfectly to every impulse of her talent, each touch of character or dialogue as telling as a malicious sense of comedy could make it arms, hands, shoulders, all aiding to the final result, a table swept by a very storm of laughter, in the midst of which Kitty quietly finished her strawberry. Well done, Kitty! Ash, who sat opposite to her, stretched his hand across and patted hers. Does she love him? Cliff asked himself, and could not make up his mind, closely as he tried to observe their relations. He was more and more conscious of the exciting effect she produced on himself, doubly so indeed because of that sudden stroke of melancholy, wherewith, like a Rembrandt shadow, she had thrown into relief the gaiety and frivolity of her ordinary mood. The stimulus, whatever it was, played upon his vanity. He too sought an opening and found it. Soon it was he who was monopolising the conversation with an account of two days spent with Bismarck in a Prussian country house, during the triumphant days of the winter which followed on Sadoa. The story was brilliantly told, and of some political importance, but it was disfigured by arrogance and affectation, and Ash's eyes began to dance a little. Cliff, meanwhile, could not forget that he was in the presence of a rival, and an official, could not refrain, after a while, from a note of challenge here and there. The conversation diverged from the tale into matters of current foreign politics. Ash, lounging and smoking, at first knew nothing, had heard of nothing, as usual. Then a comment or correction dropped out. Cliff repeated himself vehemently, only to provoke another. Presently, no one knew how, the two men were measured against each other corps à corps. The wide knowledge and trained experience of the minister against the originality, the force, fantastic imagination of the writer. The dean watched him with delight. He was very fond of Ash and liked to see him getting the better of the newspaper fellow. Kitty's lovely brown eyes travelled from one to the other. Now it seemed to the dean that she was proud of Ash, now that she sympathised with Cliff. Soon, however, like the god at Philippi, she swept upon the poet and bore him from the field. Not a word more politics, she said peremptorily to Ash, holding up her hand. I want to talk to Mr Cliff about the ball. Cliff was not very ready to obey. He had an angry sense of having been somehow shown to disadvantage, and would like to have challenged his host again. But Kitty poured balm into his wounds. She drew him apart a little, using the play of her beautiful eyes for him only, and talking to him in a new voice of deference. You're going, of course. Lady M told me the other day she must have you. Cliff, still a little morose, replied that his invitation had been waiting for him at his London rooms. 
He gave the information carelessly, as though it did not matter to him a straw. In reality, as soon as, while still in America, he had seen the announcement of the ball in one of the New York papers, he had written at once to the Marchioness, who was to give it an old acquaintance of his, practically demanding an invitation. It had been sent indeed with alacrity, and without waiting for its arrival, Cliff had ordered his dress in Paris. Kitty inquired what it was to be. I told my man to copy a portrait of Alva. Ah, that's right, said Kitty, nodding. That's right. Only it would have been better if it had been Torquemada. Rather nettled, Cliff asked what there might be about him that so forcibly suggested the Grand Inquisitor. Kitty, cigarette in hand, with half-shut eyes, did not answer immediately. She seemed to be perusing his face with difficulty. Strength, I suppose, she said at last, slowly. Cliff waited, then burst into a laugh. And cruelty? She nodded. Who are my victims? She said nothing. Whose tales have you been listening to, Lady Kitty? She mentioned the name of a French lady. Cliff changed countenance. Ah, oh, well, if you've been talking to her, he said haughtily, you may well expect to see me appear as Diabolos in person. No, but it's since then that I've read the poems again. You see, you tell the public so much that you think you have the right to guess the rest? He paused, then added with impatience, Don't guess, Lady Kitty. You have everything that thy life can give you. Let my secrets alone. There was silence. Kitty, looking round her, saw that Madeleine Alcott was entertaining her other guests, and that she and Cliff were unobserved. Suddenly Cliff bent towards her and said with roughness, his face struggling to conceal the feeling behind it, You heard, and you believed, that I tormented her, that I killed her? The anguish in his eyes seemed to strike a certain answering fire from Kitty's. Yes, but... But what? I didn't think it very strange. Cliff watched her closely. That a man should be an inhuman beast if he were jealous and, and desperate. You can sympathise with these things? She drew a long breath and threw away the cigarette she'd been holding suspended in her small fingers. I don't know anything about them. I don't know anything about them. Because, he hesitated, your own life has been so happy. She evaded him. Don't you think that jealousy will soon be as dead as saying your prayers and going to church? I never meet anybody that cares enough to be jealous. She spoke first with passionate force, then with contempt, glancing around the room at Madeleine Alcott. Cliff saw the look and remembered that Mrs. Alcott's husband, a distinguished treasury official, had been for years the intimate friend of a very noble and beautiful woman, herself unhappily married. There was no scandal in the matter, though much talk. Mrs. Alcott, meanwhile, had her own affairs. Her husband and she were apparently on friendly terms, only neither ever spoke of the other, and their relations remained a mystery. Cliff bent over to Kitty. And yet you said you could understand. Such things didn't seem strange to you. She gave a little reckless laugh. Did I? It's like the people who think they could act or sing if only they had the chance. I choose to think I could feel. Of course I couldn't. We've lost the power. All the old, horrible, splendid things are dead and done with. The old passions, you mean? And the old poems. You'll never write like that again. God forbid, said Cliff under his breath. Then as Kitty rose, he followed her with his eyes. Lady Kitty, you've thrown me a challenge that you hardly understand. Some day I must answer it. No, don't answer it, said Kitty hastily. Yes, if I can drag the words out, he said sombrely. She met his look in a kind of fascination, excited by the memory of the story which had been told her, by her own audacity in speaking of it, by the presence of the dead passion she divined lying shrouded and ghastly in the mind of the man beside her. Even the ugly things of which he was accused did but add to the interest of his personality for a nature like hers, greedy of experience and discontented with the real. While he on his side was nattered and astonished by her attitude towards him as Ash's wife, she would surely dislike and try to trample on him. That was what he had expected. "'I hear you are an archangel, Lady Kitty,' said the dean 
who, having obstinately outstayed all the other guests, had now settled his small person and his thin legs into a chair beside his hostess with a view to five agreeable minutes. He was the most harmless of social epicures, was the dean, and he felt that Lady Kitty had defrauded him at lunch in favour of that great, ruffling, Byronic fellow Cliff, who ought to have better taste than to come lunching with the ashes. "'Am I?' said Kitty, who had thrown herself into the corner of a sofa, and sat curled up there in an attitude which the dean thought charming, though it would not, he was aware, have become Mrs. Winston. "'Well, you know best,' said the dean, "'but at any rate be good and explain to me what is an archangel.' "'Somebody whom most men and all women dislike,' said Kitty promptly. "'Yet they seemed to be numerous,' remarked the dean. "'Not at all,' cried Kitty with an air of offence. "'Not at all. "'If they were numerous, they would, of course, be popular. "'And, in fact, they are rare and detested. "'What other characteristics have they?' "'Courage,' said Kitty, looking up. "'Courage to break rules. "'I hear they all call one another by their Christian names "'and live in one another's rooms "'and borrow one another's money "'and despise conventionalities. "'I'm sorry you are an archangel, Lady Kitty.' "'I didn't admit that I was,' said Kitty. "'But if I am, why are you sorry?' "'Because,' said the Dean, smiling, "'I thought you were too clever to despise conventionalities.' "'Kitty sat up with revived energy.' and joined battle. She flew into a tirade as to the dullness and routine of English life, the stupidity of good people, and the tyranny of English hypocrisy. The dean listened with amusement, then with a shade of something else. At last he got up to go. Well, you know, we've heard all that before. My point of view is so much more interesting, subtle, romantic. Anybody can attack Mrs. Grundy, but only a person of originality can adore her. Try it, Lady Kitty. It would be really worth your while. Kitty mocked and exclaimed, Do you know what that phrase, that name of abomination, always recalls to me? pursued the old man. It bores me even to guess, was Kitty's petulant reply. Does it? I think of some of the noblest people I have ever known, brave men, beautiful women, who fought Mrs. Grundy and perished. The dean stood looking down upon her, with an eager, sensitive expression. Tales that he had heeded very little when he had first heard them ran through his mind. He had thought Lady Kitty's intimate tete-a-tete -tete with her husband's assailant in the press disagreeable and unseemly, and as for Mrs. Orcott, he had disliked her particularly. Kitty looked up unquelled. "'Tis better to have fought and lost than never to have fought at all,' she quoted, with one of her most radiant and provoking smiles. Incorrigible, cried the dean, catching up his cat. I see. Once an archangel, always an archangel. Oh, no, said Kitty. There may be war in heaven. Well, don't take Mrs. Alcott for a leader. That's all, said the dean, as he held out a hand of farewell. And now I understand, cried Kitty triumphantly. You detest my best friend. The dean laughed, protested, and went out. Ash, who had been writing letters while Kitty and the Dean were talking, escorted the old man to the door. When he returned, he found Kitty sitting with her hands in her lap, lost, apparently, in thought. Darling, he said, looking at his watch, I must be off directly, but I should like to see the boy. Kitty started. She rang, and the child was brought down. He sat on Kitty's knee, and Ash, coming to the sofa, threw an arm round them both. "'You're not a bad-looking pair,' he said, kissing first Kitty and then the baby. "'But he's rather pale, Kitty. I think he wants the country.' Kitty said nothing, but she lifted the little white embroidered frock and looked at the twisted foot. Then Ash felt her shudder. "'Dear, don't be morbid,' he cried resentfully. "'He'll have so much brains that nobody will remember that. Think of Byron.' Kitty did not seem to have heard. I remember so well when I first saw his foot, after your mother told me and they brought him to me, she said slowly. It seemed to me it was the, the end. The end of what? Of my dream. What do you mean, Kitty? Do you remember the mask in The Tempest? First Iris with saffron wings and rich Ceres and great Juno? She half closed her eyes. 
then the nymphs and the reapers dancing together on the short grassed green the sweetest gayest show she breathed the words out suddenly then suddenly she sat up stiffly and struck her small hands together prospero starts and speaks and in a moment without warning with a strange hollow and confused noise she dragged the words drearily they heavily vanish that she pointed shuddering to the child's foot was for me the sign of prospero ash looked at her with anxiety finding it indeed impossible to laugh at her she was very pale her breath came with difficulty and she trembled from head to foot he tried to draw her into his arms but she held him away that first year i had been so happy she continued in the same voice everything was so perfect so glorious life was like a great pageant in a palace all the old terrors went i often had fears as a child fears i couldn't put into words but that overshadowed me then when i saw alice the shadow came nearer but that was all gone i thought god was reconciled to me and would always be kind to me now and then i saw that foot and i knew that he hated me still he burned his mark into my baby's flesh and i was never to be quite happy again but always in fear fear of pain and death and grief she paused her large eyes gazed into vacancy and her whole slight frame showed the working of some mysterious and pitiful distress a wave of poignant alarm swept through ash's mind coupled also with a curious sense of something foreseen he had never witnessed precisely this mood in her before but now that it was thus revealed he was suddenly aware that something like it had been for long moving obscurely below the surface of her life he took the child and laid him on the floor where he rolled at ease cooing to himself then he came back to kitty and soothed her with extraordinary tenderness and skill presently she looked at him as though some obscure trouble of which he had been the victim had released her and she were herself again don't go away just yet she said in a voice which was still low and shaken he came close to her again put his arms round her and held her on his breast in silence that is heavenly he heard her say to herself after a while in a whisper kitty his eyes grew dim and he stooped to kiss her heavenly she went on still as though following out her own thoughts rather than speaking to him because one yields yields life is such tension always she closed her eyes quickly and he watched the beautiful lashes lying still upon her cheek with an emotion he could not explain for it was not an emotion of the senses just as her yielding had not been a yielding of the senses but a yielding of the soul he continued to hold her in his arms her life her will given to him wholly sighed out upon his heart then gradually she recovered her balance the normal kitty came back she put out her hand and touched his face you must go back to the house william yes if you are all right she sat up and began to rearrange some of her hair that had slipped down you have carried us both into such heights and depths darling said ash after he watched her a little in silence that i have forgotten to tell you the gossip i brought back from mother this morning kitty paused interrogatively she was still pale do you know that mother is convinced mary lister has made up her mind to marry cliff there was a pause then kitty said with incredulous contempt he would never dream of marrying her not so sure she has a great deal of money and cliff wants money badly ash began to put his papers together kitty questioned him a little more intermittently as to what her mother had said when he had left her she sat for long on the sofa playing with some flowers she had taken from her dress or sombrely watching the child as it lay on the floor beside her end of part two chapter nine